morning. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today at Gross Point Woods Presbyterian Church. Uh, any visitors who would like to be included in our mailing list, please fill out the Let's Get Acquainted <coughs> card and put it in the hallway in the in the hallway in the basket. Uh, please join us after church today for our coffee hour in the lounge. And thanks to all of you who donated generously to the Mitten Tree Project. A trunk load of mittens and gloves and hats and scarves were taken to the Capuchin Service Center last week in Detroit. Thanks of all, to all of you who participated in the blood drive last week. This is National Blood Donor Month, so if you're unable to give last Tuesday, it isn't too late. You can call ahead to 1-800-RED-CROSS to make an appointment to give at another nearby drive. As you may know, there's a critical blood shortage across the nation right now. Tomorrow, the church office will be closed in observance of Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. And please don't forget, on the 29th, uh, we are having our annual congressional meeting. All are asked to attend, because we need a quorum. <laughs> and the annual report will be available next Sunday. Now let us pray our call to worship. Please respond. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. We live sustained by God's presence and love. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. As we <coughs> mourn the wounds of God's children, God weeps with, with us. <coughs> As we give thanks for brothers and sisters who have lived in faith, God, God gives, gives thanks, thanks to us. us. As we struggle for justice, God, God struggles, struggles with, with us. us. As we strive for peace, God, God strives with, with us. As we work to build the beloved community, God, God works, works with us. us. As we offer our gifts to all, God blesses us. Sisters and brothers rejoice. Sustained, Sustained by God's presence, presence and love, and love we, we worship, worship God. God. Please stand and join us for our first hymn. <laughs> One other little uh, announcement. Uh, please follow us today on our on our screen here. We're going to follow our service with the screen. Thank you. <laughs> please join me. Oh. Please join me in our call of confession. Sisters and brothers, <clears throat> let us confess our sin to God, who weeps, struggles, and prays, and works with us every day of our life. Please join me in their prayer of confession. Most, Most holy, holy and merciful, merciful God, we acknowledge and confess our slowness, slowness to do good, our blindness to injustice, our complicity in deferring the dreams and hopes of the oppressed. We have been slow to heed your call, if at all, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. We condemn, we condemn injustice, injustice in, our in our pronouncements, 
yet we, yet cling, we cling to the, to the privileges, privileges derived from inequity. When we, when we ought to be ashamed of our failures, we prefer, we prefer to, to cling to, to private, private, selfish, imprisoning desires. <coughs> Help us to name our, our sin, sin, to claim, to claim responsibility, responsibility for our actions, and to change our behavior in accordance with the commands of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Shake us from our slumber with your imperative to do justice. Move us to action with compassion of your grace. grace. And, and give us courage, courage to, pay to pay the price, price however, however painful or costly, or costly that, that justice may be done on earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Amen. Amen. Please uh, hear and respond to our assurance of pardon. Christ is our hope and our peace. By his sacrifice, he has, he has torn, torn down, down every barrier between, between us and heaven, heaven between, between us and all humanity. humanity. By his spirit, he has built, he has us, built up us up into one, one body, one, one holy temple filled with worship and praise. As we repent and believe, he, he transforms, transforms the empowers. We will live, we will live as people, people reconciled, reconciled in the peace of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Spirit of the living God, <coughs> turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts <coughs> by the word we now declare and ponder. In ancient pages, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for the witness in your world. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. First reading today is from Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. The word of the Lord.
<clears throat> Thank you, choir. The second scripture reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as, testimo just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by God you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Today's first scripture, Micah, is what many people use as a compass in and throughout their lives. When things are ambiguous or it's hard to tell what is the right thing to do, whether one is struggling with their faith, with their conscience, what to do, many Christians often come back to this verse and use it as a compass to point to God, to set aside one's own inclinations and seek after the heart of God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow before the exalted God? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Micah mentions three things that God requires. Doing justice, <coughs> excuse me, loving kindness, sometimes also translated as mercy, and walking humbly. To take mercy or kindness, the Hebrew word that is used here is hesed. It's much richer in many, uh, in, in, it's much richer than the English language offers. It's often translated as faithfulness, steadfast love, kindness, loving kindness, mercy, and it's used more of God, God's love for us, God's steadfast love for us, than it is in people. In reality, hesed is all of these things, faithfulness, steadfast love, kindness, mercy, all rolled into one. It also involves action, love expressed in activity towards others. We could say that the same is true of walking humbly. For starters, walking with God implies an active faith, where one seeks God as a daily guide, it implies that we are seeking God in all aspects of our lives. And as we do so, we are reminded that as followers of God, we are to be marked by a life of humility. We are encouraged to set aside our own selfish desires and align ourselves to God's will as opposed to our own. It means having full reliance on God, not ourselves. So how about this? justly thing. What does it mean to do justice? Justice might seem simple, but there's a lot here, and many of us don't have a full grasp of the biblical concept. And in speaking, <clears throat> it speaks directly to many of our current issues. When we think justice, many of us conjure in just images of a courtroom with a judge, attorneys, witnesses, and a jury, or Tom Cruise saying, I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. That was funny. All right, anyways. Simply put, <laughs> we usually think of justice as being a punishment or wrongdoing. Someone has committed a crime and justice is served. They, they get the punishment that they deserve. The word used for justice throughout the Bible, and here in this passage in Micah 6, is misfat. It includes this type of punishment, or retributive justice, <coughs> excuse me, but it's also more than that. 
It includes giving people their due or their right. This is also referred to as restorative justice. In today's words, reparative justice. It's proactively seeking out the vulnerable and helping them. Ms. Pat is used more than 200 times in the Old Testament, <clears throat> often to speak to the idea of treating all people fairly and as they deserve, since we are all created equally in the image of God. In Deuteronomy 18, we see that the tithe that is to be set aside for the priestly work is called mispat. In Proverbs 3, uh, 31, 9, it says, Open your mouth and judge righteously. De defend the rights of the poor and needy. Here, mispat is giving people their due, which can, be inclu which can include protection and care. In the Psalms, the psalmist of 146 writes, The Lord executes justice, for the oppressed gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over sojourners. The Lord upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. This speaks of God breaking down unjust systems and restoring dignity to the downtrodden. So given this enhanced view of the word for justice, mispat, it's clear that the meaning is far beyond making sure that the bad guys are punished. If we are passively watching the plight of the vulnerable or oppressed and giving it what amounts to a shoulder shrug, meh, bystanders, we are guilty in God's eyes of shirking our responsibilities. True biblical mispat is when the problems of the vulnerable become my problems. True righteousness, in turn, is tied to my posture towards the community. Some of you may remember that in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King came to Gross Point High. I wasn't around then, but some of you may have been. And he said <clears throat> in his speech that night, let me say finally that in the midst of the hollering and in the midst of the discourtesy tonight, we got to, see, we got, we got to come to see that however much we dislike it, the destinies of white and black America are tied together. Now, the racists don't understand this, apparently, but our destinies are tied together. And somehow, we must all learn to live together as brothers and sisters in this country, or we're all going to perish together as fools. Our destinies are tied together. He continues, we must come to see. Yes, we do need each other. The black man needs the white man to save him from his fear, and the white man needs the black man to free him from his guilt. He says all of this much more concisely in his I Have a Dream speech, 1963, and he says, and they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. Fifteen days into the new year, I have not really heard a huge uproar in the media today about the great injustices of this nation. It happens daily, all the time, but there hasn't been a huge incident. This country, the world, still grapples with the ongoing unrest in response to racial tension and, just, and injustice. But the same things that, we are going, that were going on in the 1960s are actually, in many ways, the things we are still dealing with today, but maybe in different ways. In, um, in his speech, in, Martin, in Dr. Martin Luther King's speech at Gross Point High, he said, every city in our country has this kind of dualism, the schizophrenia split at so many parts. And so every city ends up being two cities rather than one. There are two Americas. One America is beautiful for situation. In this America, millions of people 
have milk of prosperity and the honey of equality flowing before them. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, culture, and education for their minds. Freedom, human dignity. In this America, children grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But there is another America. This other America has a daily ugliness about it that transforms the buoyancy of hope into a fatigue of despair. In this other America, thousands and thousands of people, men in particular, walk the streets and search for jobs that do not exist. In this other America, millions of people are forced to live in distressing housing situations. In this other America, thousands of young people are deprived of an opportunity to get an adequate education. <coughs> this was 60 years ago, but somehow it still rings true today. Hopefully a little less so, but still true in many ways. As one tries to make sense of what is going on and survive through these turbulent and challenging times, one of the most quoted and shared passages, particularly by those seeking justice, is this passage today. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy or kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So to close out today's message, um, it's not going to take 17 minutes as it did Dr. Martin Luther King, but I would like to read the speech in its entirety. Um, Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who have been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But a hundred years later, the Negro still is not free 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro need to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. 
we must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest, protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, <clears throat> we must make the pledge that we shall march ahead and we cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic most mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We cannot be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been veterans of creative suffering, continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums of, and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you today, my friends. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream it is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children with one, will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governors having lips dipping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountains of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing 
with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain, let freedom ring. Amen. from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountain, the real world where injustice of remember the homeless. When I eat, I must secure and privilege is norm no more, and all your children know wholeness and well-being.
As you go out, remember the words, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Amen.